Welcome back, week three. So last week, this tutorial was on axial skeleton. This week, appendicular. We know repetition is the key to adult learning, so let's just review. Axial skeleton consists of what structures, which bones? Skull, vertebrae, which areas of the vertebrae? Cervical, thoracic, lumbar, and what are the last two? Sacral and coccyx, good. Also it includes thoracic cage, so ribs, how many pairs of ribs are there? 12. The sternum, and one more bone. What's that other bone that's included in the axial skeleton? Remember? Hyoid bone, good. That's axial. We're done with that, we're not coming back to that. We're moving forward. Moving on to the appendicular skeleton. That includes your appendages, your arms and legs, and the bones that help anchor them onto that axial skeleton. So again, let's get out our list of bones and bony landmarks from Moodle, and we're going to continue on, onto the appendicular skeleton. Upper extremity. Now the two bones that really anchor that upper extremity onto the axial skeleton are the clavicle and the scapula. They're paired, you have a right clavicle and a left clavicle, right scapula, left scapula. That's going to be true for the entire appendicular skeleton. If you have it on the right, then you've got it on the left. Okay, so we'll just assume that moving forward. With the scapula, you have this area that really protrudes out laterally and comes around. This is the acromion process. Most anteriorly, you have a coracoid process. Now these will be important because oftentimes in bones, when you see something protruding, it's a great place for muscular attachment. So in the future, when you learn about muscles and where they attach to, you're going to hear these bony landmark names again. So acromion process, coracoid process, and then glenoid fossa. It's where the humerus, the head of the humerus, actually sits in on that scapula in there. Moving on to the humerus, the humerus is the single long bone, the upper portion of your arm. On the humerus, we have the head of the humerus, which looks like a ball. Your head's round like a ball, head of the humerus, very similar. Distally, you have condyles. Condyles are typically areas where we see two bones come together and create a joint. So those are condyles. Epicondyles are the outer portions of those joints, and those epicondyles are on the side. Again, bony prominences or bumps sticking out, which make for great muscular attachments. So humerus, head of the humerus, condyles, and epicondyles. Moving more distally on the arm, again, anatomical position, palm facing forward, right? If we look at the palm facing forward, you have a radius and an ulna. The easiest way to remember that is that the radius, radius radiates outwardly. So radius is always most lateral. Ulna is the one, if you bend your elbow, you feel that really pointy part of your elbow. That's the olecranon process. So that's the olecranon process of the ulna, radius, and then moving down into our wrist, into the carpals. You have eight carpal bones on each side. Now there are different acronyms that might help you learn these because it's kind of hard to just stick into your brain. So look those up, see if there's a couple that help you remember them. Starting with the most proximal row, now remember proximal means closest to the trunk, right? Scaphoid, scaphoid is going to be most lateral and most proximal. Lunate, triquetrium, and pisiform. Then moving to the distal row, so there's two rows with these. You then have the triquetrium. Nope, sorry. Moving to the most distal row, you now have the trapezium, the trapezoid, capitate, and hamate. Hamate has a little hook on it. That kind of helps you with that. And the pisiform looks like a little pea-sized bone. So those two things might help you as well. Moving more distally, you now have metacarpals. Meta means change, right? So moving from carpals to our phalanges, which are going to be our fingers, we have metacarpals. For both the hand and the foot, they're going to mirror one another. So once you've learned this once, it will help you when you move down to the foot. Anatomical position, if you think of the thumb, 
the thumb will always be number one. So this is metacarpal one, Roman numeral one. And as you move through thumb to pointer finger all the way down to pinky, it will go one, two, three, four, five. So you just number them, metacarpal one, metacarpal two, metacarpal three, metacarpal four, metacarpal five, but they're Roman numerals, so remember that. As you move distally, now you're into the fingers. Now each of these fingers are going to have three separate bones. These are phalanges, proximal phalanx, distal phalanx, middle one, middle phalanx, right? Pretty easy to remember. However, on our thumb and on our big toe, there's only a proximal and distal. There is no middle one. Makes sense. Thumb tends to be a little bit shorter guy, right? And again, they will be numbered the same way that you did with your metacarpals. So proximal phalanx one. That will be that first bone of your thumb, right? Roman numerals again, so remember that. So upper extremity, really it's going to look very similar in our lower extremity. So let's head there next. For lower extremity, we're going to start with the pelvis. The pelvis is really two halves that come together to create an entire circle. Now in the front, they meet at the pubic symphysis, and in the back, they meet the sacrum. They anchor into the axial skeleton that way. So one half of the pelvis is called an innominate, or the os cocci. We're going to look at just one half of that pelvis. The pelvis is actually, one half of it is three bones that have been fused together. You have your ilium, which is really that big, broad blade of a bone that you feel up here. The ischium, which if you were to sit in a chair and sit on your hands, you feel that bony mark underneath your bum, that's the ischium. It's your ischial tuberosity. And then on the front, you have the pubic bone. All three of them fuse together to create one half of your pelvis through there. Iliac crest through here. Then acetabulum is the round area where we see the femur articulate and become a joint and become your hip joint in there. As we move forward, these things are going to sound very similar to what we just did up here. The most proximal, long, large bone is the femur. And just like that we saw in the humerus, it has a head, round ball, just like your head's a big round ball on your shoulders, right? Same thing, head of the femur. And as we move distally, you have condyles that articulate with the lower bones in order to create your knee joint. And on the outside, you have epicondyles, which are just bony protuberances sticking out, which make for great attachment sites for muscles. As you move more distally, again, just like we saw in the arm, we have two long bones. Same thing down here. We have the tibia and the fibula. As you move distally along the tibia, he makes up the middle part of your ankle. That's the medial malleolus. Laterally, you see the fibula, lateral malleolus. We have all like cracked our heel on the edge of a table. Ugh, so painful. That's what those guys are, right? Now, one little guy that we've jumped over here is a sesamoid bone, kind of this floating bone in the middle of tendon, and that's your patella. That's gonna be your kneecap. Moving back distally, now remember we had our carpals, now we have our tarsals, our ankle bones. So with our tarsal bones, we first have the tarsus, so we have our tibia that articulates with the tarsal bone here. Then we have most posterior, our calcaneus, we go back to this tarsal bone here, the tarsus, and we move anteriorly. That's your navicular bone. Move anterior to that, and we have three bones that look very similar. They're called the cuneiforms, and they're labeled based off of their location. So you have medial, which is most medial. Now don't confuse that with middle. You have a medial one, then a middle one, because he's wedged in between the two, and then you have a lateral cuneiform in there, okay? And then as we continue through, our last little bit, we have our cuboid on the outside and it looks very much like a cube shape. That's kind of the easiest way to remember that. Moving distally, just like we did in the hand and you had metacarpals, guess what you have down here? Metatarsals, right? It's that transition. And just like we started with the thumb is Roman numeral one, this great toe, Roman numeral one, right? Metatarsal one, two, three, four, five. Just like we did with our fingers, the phalanges, you have the phalanges down here, our toes down here, right? You have a proximal and distal, and then you have proximal, middle, and distal phalanxes 
for your feet as well. What's nice about the appendicular skeleton is it feels a little bit repetitive from upper extremity to lower extremity. So once you learn the names, it's pretty easy to move forward from there. There are some things about the skeleton I want to bring to your attention. Let's start with male versus female. So male versus female skeleton. What are some things that you might think might be different in bones of men versus bones of women? Well, let's start with some obvious physical characteristics. Men have more testosterone than women. More testosterone creates more muscle mass, and more muscle mass means you need to be able to carry the weight of that, and it's going to pull on the bones harder. That means the bones must be thicker and stronger. So male bones tend to be heavier, thicker, and larger. Even some of these bony prominences tend to be larger on males because of the repetitive pull of muscle on them. Now with the skull, what we often see, sorry guys, it's just true, but in the foreheads, we start to see a sloping forehead in the men, kind of that caveman appearance. Just saying, it's true, it's scientific. And then for women, we see more of the flat forehead, much more of an upright forehead. In the men, we tend to see a thicker, more prominent jawline than we tend to see in women as well. Probably the area that's most pronounced in differences between male and female is going to be the pelvis. Now with the pelvis for women, what's one of the biggest differences between male and female regarding the pelvis? Childbearing, right? Women have to carry a child and then they have to birth the child or multiple children, right? So it's helpful if you're going to push a child through your pelvis, do you want it to be narrow or wide? Why? That's why women have wider hips. It's literally for the function of delivering a baby. So men, your pelvis tends to be narrower and taller. Because women, if we take our pelvis and stretch it out, it's going to get wider and shorter. What you also see is the pubic angle, where the pubic bone is. It goes from being narrow for men to wider for women. So it's kind of like taking the pelvis and stretching it out. It will get shorter and wider, including the pelvic angle. And even the pelvic outlet will be wider in order for a baby, a fetus, to be able to drop down and then eventually go through the birth canal for delivery. Those are some of the major differences from male and female skeleton. As we move forward, since we're talking about appendages, the appendicular skeleton, the most noted thing we see are joints, right? That's a difference that we start seeing come in more mobility through there. Let's talk about three different joints. So we talk about organizing. This is where I would take joints and I would make three different categories in different color and put examples and maybe even drawings of different joints to help me remember the difference in these. So with our three joints, we're going to use the term articulations because any place where one bone comes to another bone, it's considered an articulation. Now, if you remember in the skull, we started there and talked about those parietal bones coming together and fusing together. After a while, that fontanelle disappears and we start to fuse our cranium together, right? Now those sutures do not move. So those are called synarthrosis joints. They don't move. They're very stationary and that's what we want. That creates stability and security. We want that, we want to protect our brain. So those are synarthrosis joints. Amphiarthrosis, amphi is kind of that transition, a little bit of both, so it has a tiny bit of mobility, but it's not freely moving. So amphiarthrosis joints, some examples of that would be your pubic symphysis, and in the back, where your pelvis articulates with the sacrum, that's your sacroiliac joint. Now when you think about walking, what happens is you actually get a little bit of rotation and twisting in there. Now, not a lot because we want stability, being able to transmit the force from the ground through your body, but we want to be able to be mobile and be upright and walking. So you'll see a little bit of twisting and giving in those joints. Those are amphiarthrosis joints. The last group is diarthrosis joints or synovial joints. These are the things that you typically think of when you think of a joint. Your knee joint, your elbow, your shoulder, your hip. They're more freely moving in that. So those are our diarthrosis joints. That's it for appendicular skeleton. Hopefully that helps joints make sense, makes three clear classifications. Hopefully appendicular skeleton, you see the correlation with upper extremity and lower extremity and that helps you as well. 
Good luck studying.